Good morning or good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're in. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. With me today is Father James. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce your last name because I get it wrong, um, but it's an honor to have you here today. Thank you, Father, for joining us. Welcome. Um, Father James is a Roman Catholic monk in Kerala, India, and his uh, PhD was earned in Rome at the Pontificium Institution Orientalism Studiorum. How have you pronounced it? I think I had a friend that went there, but it doesn't mean I can pronounce these words. And your dissertation was on the Mariological Thought of Mar Jacob of Sarug, which makes you a very important expert on Mariology, particularly in Jacob of Sarug who's a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, and you said his feast day was just a couple days ago for you. No, that is the feast of St. Thomas, the Apostle. Oh, St. Thomas. I'm getting I'm confused. St. Thomas is also very important in Kerala. My apologies. Now I remember. Yes, the, um, our, our Apostle. It's, he's the Apostle to India. We had a, a show on the early church in India a few months ago, and God willing, we'll have a, another show on the medieval history of Christianity in Kerala in a month or so. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about Jacob Sroog, who Father James is telling me is extremely important because he said something like half your liturgical hymns are from Jacob Sroog. Oh, more, more than half. More than half. Okay, so he's ultra important. He's pretty much the St. John of Damascus of Christianity in Kerala then, because uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, John of Damascus wrote the majority of our hymns, which are in the Aptekos, Menayan, etc. And because I am so grateful to have you here today, um, because of your background in studying uh, the issue of Mariology and Jacob of Sarug, I just want to warn the audience, this is a real special treat. Father James does not come out very often to do these sort of things. And so one of us has an imperfect microphone. We might be playing around a little bit with that, but it's well worth it. Now, Father James, before we get started, when you studied in Rome, uh, you did some translation work. You said that um, Dr. Sebastian Brock helped you out a little bit with it. Yeah, I translated the homily on the virginity of Holy Mary, Mother of God, and uh, it was done under the guidance of my professor, Nin Manel, and uh, my assistant uh, director, Professor Sarra Damo. He's originally a Chaldean. Uh, he helped me, and also it was checked by Professor Brock, who was very kind to help me. Yes. Okay, and... Uh... How did he like the food at Rome, by the way? Uh, it's buono. <laughs> My opinion is the food in Rome is terrible. <laughs> and if you're used to food in India, which actually has flavor, it probably was a difficult adjustment. But yeah. uh, deny. <laughs> Subjective thing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. The um, So... Let's get started a little bit talking about Jacob of Sarug, but we really can't talk about him with talk, without talking about Ephraim the Syrian. So could he give us a little bit of background of what ethnicities Ephraim and Jacob belonged to and what was their connection with the rest of the Christian world at their times? Uh, it's a good question, but before answering, let, let us uh, spend one minute in prayer. Almighty Father, you send your son to redeem us from our sins. We thank you. You have sent your Holy Spirit to guide us in our daily life. We thank you. Today, you have given us the occasion to revere Mary, whom you have chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. She lived her faith in the exemplary way. She is now in the communion of saints.
bless you glorify you adore you along with the company of angels and martyrs and all saints we ask you to bless us so that this dialogue this interview will help us to glorify you to know you deeply and to help us live our christian life in the most honest sincere and faithful way in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen thank you thank you father it's some some guys don't want to pray beforehand so i didn't want to be presumptuous but thank you for doing so because it does put things in perspective these things and i know we agree because we talked about this are not merely a matter of intellectual curiosities the saints are great because god is glorious in his saints and so when we're talking about a saint like the theotokos it's important because we're talking about the things of god and knowing the saints better helps us grow closer to god and all that honoring the saints the saints are praying for us and interceding for us in heaven so it's extremely important because these are the things of god and so i'm grateful that it's clear that this is where you're coming from and this will come out in the interview and so i'm gonna blame my son he kept my wife and i up all last night but I'm going to kind of restart the interview and say, all right, let's restart with that question. Now that we've began in prayer, which is what ethnicities did Ephraim and Jacob belong to? And what was their connection to the rest of the Christian world? In fact, uh, we have to limit the answer to certain aspects because it's a vast topic and books have been written on this topic. Let us come to St. Ephraim, who lives in the fourth century. And uh, I would like to look at the milieu in two ways. Namely, uh, Ephraim is known as a teacher and his uh, role in the church was that of a deacon. Mardiakab of Edessa, the Bishop of Edessa appointed him as head, that is interpreter of the Christian school at Nisibis. And so I would like to say only these two things. One is he is a member of ascetic group. He has either founded or was a foremost member or practitioner of this asceticism. And perhaps you have heard the word Ihidaya. Ihidaya is a Syriac word standing for solitary ascetic life. And uh, there is another term called covenanters, B'nai Kiyama. That means those people who have deserted the world in order to have the communion with God, in order to lead a life of perfection. So the ethnicity, when you speak about it, I would say one thing is that his background as a monk, as a solitary, and secondly, his role as a teacher. And may I, why I focus only on these two things? This is uh, what we will see more reflected uh, in his uh, commentary on the Gospels or any book. And also, Mayor Jacob of Saruk ha has a panegyric on uh, him on St. Ephraim, where he uh, refers to Jacob not as an ascetic or monk, but as a teacher, because he has taught the true faith, uh, which is antidote to the poison of heretics, according to Mar Jacob, because uh, at the time of, so this is the ethnicity, so to say, at the time of Ephraim, the heretics, the heresies taught by Bardaisan, Mani, Marson, etc., were dominating. So I think it is in these two aspects that we have to see St. Ephraim. So I am not going to many other aspects, but of course, the, uh, the concepts of Judeo-Christian theology or Judeo-Christian concepts, namely that has been handed over through the early liturgical documents such as Didache, Didascalia, um, and also other uh, writings. They have been of very help to St. Ephraim or even to develop a big concepts about the holy mystery 
his exegesis and uh, other compositions as well. So I will limit on these two aspects. Of course, there are many other aspects. Uh, we have uh, the political and so on, but uh, I think the uh, for um, understanding um, a frame as a spiritual leader, these two are the things I would like to focus. All right, and it's and it's worth pointing out that both Ephraim and Jacob of Saru were at the fringes of the Roman Empire, so they would have been on the periphery, but within the the Roman world of their time. So, what distinct elements of Syriac Christianity predated Ephraim and informed his thought? Actually, uh, the the elements uh, following what I have already said. Uh, there is a common source for um, Saint Ephraim and also later on for Mar Jacob of Sarug also, especially the canonical scriptures. And uh, as we can very well imagine, not in the form that we have, they, they, they didn't have. For example, uh, the scripture available to them was more in the form of uh, the Arthas throne of Tatsian. And then, um, other scriptures or what we don't consider as scriptures, the apocryphal writings had a good influence on them. Then early writers such as Bardaisan, Afrahat. So these uh, scholars also were very influential and uh, I am um, inclined to think that uh, these fathers, both of them have uh, a common uh, other in the person of Bardaisan, who composed some 150 hymns, which are unique, which have got ideas um, and imagery drawn from Christianity, from the scriptures itself. And he has composed the so-called uh, gender called the Madrasha, which is a hymn in its own uh, structure with parallelism, rhyme, alliteration and uh, a variety of wordplay to achieve its effect. So I would say these are the common things for them. And then uh, what is more important is these fathers, they have made use of this, what was already available and they have, uh, of course, they have reflected the contemporary situation of their lifetime and they have taken the freedom to compose their own hymns and that is why we have uh, in Saint Ephraim, the Ephraim's memory, memory are, uh, we can translate them as discourse, homily, speech, etc. So those metrical homilies, let me translate memory like metrical homilies. Ephraim has composed it in the septa syllabic uh, form. That means having seven syllables. Whereas Mar Jacob of Sarug, he has taken the freedom to, to use Dodeka uh, syllabic, that is 12 syllables uh, structure for his memory. And uh, these are the, uh, some of the main common elements, so to say that, namely uh, the common scripture, apocryphal writings, and then the common source of uh, these writers. And uh, one more thing uh, for Mar Jacob is, after the time of Saint Ephraim, uh, there were scholars like Cyrilona or Balai the Great, and then Simon the Potter. Some elements of these um, writers are, they have got a beautiful hints about the mystery of Christ. And uh, the Simon the Potter has a unique influence in the West Syrian liturgy, in the sense, uh, Potter in the Syriac, it would mean Kukoyo. Kukoyo means co Potter, Potter. So maybe when he was making the pots, he has put his own uh, tones or etc. Probably anyway, that Kukoyo tone is the Syriac home for Potter. I mean, so in that way, these writers are common to them and the scriptures and of course their style. And then now come when we come to the content, Ephraim and Mar Jacob, if you have, I am sure that you have read at least the, some of the writings of these uh, uh, scholars, uh, their approach 
is uh, really um, that of mystical, that I would say. In the way, uh, as you have mentioned earlier, the importance is not for some intellectual exercises. They were uh, focusing more on the target, the aim of their study. Namely, as I have spoken about reframe, attainment of perfection, Christian perfection. For uh, Ephraim, uh, uh, who led an ascetic life, that was the means to attain this perfection. So let it be in the exegesis or in any topic they have dealt with, their uh, main aim is to conform to Christ, who became humble and who led a life in view of redeeming the human being. And that we, as Christians, uh, receive the blessings of redemption achieved in Christ. That is, uh, in some, what I would say about these two scholars. Am I clear? Now, if you don't mind, uh, I feel sad about, uh, sorry about saying this, but just readjusting the microphone. How have the syllables in the hymns of Jacob Asarug and in Ephraim the Syrian, how do they translate over into Malayalam? Like, do they lose their syllables? And just so the audience is aware, Malayalam for pronouncing it right is the liturgical language in Kerala. Do they lose the syllables? Or are they very careful in translating them so that Jacob Asrug's hymns maintain the yeah. same syllable uh, setup? Yeah, the, uh, they, uh, in, in the translation, uh, the church has kept the same syllables in the translation also. Oh, okay. That's interesting. For example, the is the custom of Saint Mary uh, Jacob is Sir Kuganatha Yangale Yange Ammayude Yum in Sudan Ma or May Ringal. So this is the same in the Syriac also. Anyway, I have not uh, uh, practiced it in Syriac, so I am not able to give you more examples of this. Hello. All right, I disappeared for a second. My apologies. <laughs> Father, are you there? Yeah. All right, yeah, this, I, I think I'm having internet problems on my end. My apologies. Um, but all right, I did hear you say that in Amalayalam that the hymns maintain the same amount of syllables, so they had to probably be very careful in translating them. Uh, and let me ask this. It is often stereotyped that Jacob is no different than Ephraim in his thought and does not theologically develop his thought either. To what degree is this stereotype true? I would say that there is... Uh... Uh, they are not contemporaries as such. Some 78 years after the death of uh, St. Ephraim, uh, Mar Jacob lives, isn't it? So there is that uh, difference should be appreciated or should be taken into consideration when we say like that. But what is important is the homily I have referred, for example, uh, Mar Jacob's homily on St. Ephraim as a teacher. This shows his um, respect for Saint Ephraim, whom he accepted as a teacher. Therefore, in this expression, Jacob is not different from Ephraim. There is some truth in it. Okay, but what I understand is um, after after the death of Saint Ephraim, the Council of Ephesus. Council of Constant, Const Chalcedon, and other councils take place. So by the time Saint Ep Mar Jacob uh, began writing, already there were uh, two councils, isn't it? So I think uh, Mar Jacob has also had to uh, respond to or take into consideration the decisions or the interactions that took place in the council. So. In that way, that is my general observation. So there is uh, the 
general understanding is correct but at the same time there is some difference let me point out one aspect regarding this main namely uh, at the time of saint ephraim uh, we don't come across any reference to the assumption of mary but when we come to mar jacob he has got a very beautiful hymn on the death and burial of mary i think that is a progressive step i mean that reflects the time because by the 6th century already uh, the church in the in their um, background respected or revered mary as a glorious person who has whose life uh, was accepted so that she was received by the um, celestial celestial beings i mean uh, so um, in the homily we come across a very beautiful narration about all uh, glorious or the glory and happiness that takes place in heaven and in this way i think there is a difference at least in mariology i have not compared the other works so there is a there is a progress so to say so but mar jacob accepted J ephraim as a teacher and he is in line with this and then mar jacob has taken his uh, made use of his own freedom um, for composing for making comments and for reflecting about the mysteries of christ that's what i would say yeah and uh, and yeah so to recap uh, there is some development between jacob and ephraim but obviously jacob was trying to follow ephraim in his thought and uh just so you know the closer the microphone is to your mouth it might look silly but it comes out clear <laughs> and i feel really sorry for you about that but it does come a lot clearer when it's close to your mouth um the next question is what was jake's uh, jacob's methodology when it comes to discerning doctrine and teaching doctrine what would what kind of comments and methodology uh, about jacob sarug would he like to make i think that is the the methodology of mar jacob is uh, is the unique uh, thing about uh, mar jacob that we are, i as a student of mar jacob would appreciate namely uh, the general aspect or the methodology of serene fathers also or we, we call it theologization uh, it is not simply as an intellectual exercise that means um, they don't want to discover something make a judgment and then make a condemnation or of that this and then uh, try to do no this approach uh, especially mar jacob would say that is an investigative approach that is a prying into that is a, a, a scrutinizing so or investigating mar jacob would really appreciate that kind of an approach because uh, the mystery it is a mystery that is being dealt with so this cannot be verified so it is not uh, a uh, thing to be verified or verifiable in the case of other sciences so that is the basic thing and so what is his approach his approach is he would look at the thing what is the thing the thing is the mystery of incarnation when we look at the mystery of incarnation um, mardyak would say here is a mother the mother is a virgin so if somebody wants to say it's a contradiction to be a mother and virgin at the same time in the worldly terms it is a contradiction but then jacob would say just look at the at the reality look at the burning bush mount sinai where where uh, moses sees the fire but the bush is not turned into ashes and then he takes uh, many other uh, symbols and then uh, um, asks especially from the prophecy of isaiah 
Yes, sir, Kelex, attendance. Hello, Prophet, uh, Prophet, explain to us what is the mystery that you have seen. So in this way, Mardiyaka is looking at the reality of uh, incarnation. And so his approach is that of love, that of wonder, and that of humility. A love, wonder, and humility is very important to approach divine mystery because it is not a realm of our research. It is not a scientific thing. Um, it is not to be proven in the, as a scientific thing is proven, but it's a mystery. And then, because of this methodology, he begins his memory, his homily, begin with a, a prayer, a prayer of uh, humility, and a prayer um, asking God's blessings. And then he would end it up with a prayer saying, this is what I have said, help if I, if God helps me or re reveals more, I will speak about more. So that is how he also would uh, conclude it. And therefore, to be uh, precise, the attitude of looking at divine mystery with wonder, humility and love would help one to partake, to participate in, the, in this mystery. I, if you uh, meditatively read his homilies, this is what you would see. And uh, let me quote one phrase from Mar Jacob. Uh, I think I can clarify it better. Please do. Uh, okay. Uh, he says, O oh, beneficent one, whose door is open to evil ones and to sinners, grant me to enter and see your beauty while I marvel. O oh, treasure of blessings, from which even the unjust are satiated, may I be nourished by you, because you are entirely life for him who partakes of you. Cup which inebriates the soul with its draught, and it forgets its sufferings. May I drink from you, because become wise in you, and recite your story. O you, who ungrudgingly magnify our unworthy race, my word extols beautiful things with your psalms. Son of greatness, who became a little child, Grant my feeble self to speak concerning your greatness. Son of the Most High, who wanted to be with early beings, may my word be raised on high and speak to you. Uh, so th this aspect of marvel, wonder, and also the humility to receive God's blessings that is seen in his uh, homily. I, this is a citation from the homily on the Virgin, which is translated by Mary Hansberry. So in this way, um, and also there is uh, another um, homily, which, which is a prose homily on Samar, where he starts the homily like this. Come, my Lord and my God, and breathe your breath into me, like into a hall of flute, that I may produce a harmonious sound moved by your love. You know, this is, uh, St. Ephraim is known as harp of the spirit and Mar Jacob usually is addressed as flute of the Holy Spirit. So this is the meaning. They want to be known as an instrument through which the God's glory is revealed and proclaimed uh, to human beings. I think this is uh, what we can say more about the methodology. And in this methodology, what is important is he makes use of symbols and paradoxes. And symbols have a lot of raw, um, meaning in, the, in this way because only if we understand the biblical background, we will be able to understand the symbols Mar Jacob has used also. And especially, and the effectiveness of, effectiveness of symbols uh, let me say the symbol of burning bush. When we uh, look at it, we have got a lot of meanings. First of all, it evokes um, some kind of meaning in the life of, of the believer. That means you feel that you are chosen just like Moses. Secondly, 
the place you stand is holy you know it is not only mount sinai where you as a christian you are a temple of holy spirit when you where you are the place you you live is holy place and you are called for a mission whoever be it you are a child of god and you have a mission to to accomplish name and another meaning would be you should not be afraid of anything because he said i am with you and then uh, through this one more aspect is highlighted one is assured that almighty god is present to guide to protect his people from enemies and last nothing is impossible for god so this all this the theological significance uh, are implied when one uses biblical symbols such as burning bush or ark of the covenant or pure temple uh, pure castle ex- uh, the land etc and one more thing about the paradox paradoxical expressions are also necessary because they would uh, highlight the extraordinariness of what is being dealt with in theology for example fire is a symbol of transcendence and mar jacob was a fra- uh, an expression let me quote from his homily on the presentation of our lord the living fire wrapped itself round within the swaddling clothes and the briars and thorns that became aware of it fled fled from its presence the shepherd of the earth became a lamb within his own pasture and the wolves so and began fleeing in their fright so making use of such symbols like living fire wrapped in swaddling clothes etc you know the transcendence in the aspect is highlighted and using this symbol many other implications are also meant just like uh, the disappearance of briars and thorns which is occurs upon the earth Uh, because of the sin of adam we come across it in uh, chapter 3 of genesis so uh, in short making use of paradoxes and symbols uh, we we have got lot of uh, power to understand uh, the magnificence of god and uh, let me point out one more thing uh, that is about the analogy from nature now looking at mary's virginity as i have pointed out earlier Uh, there is a beautiful expression in mar jacob he says just like rays of the sun passes through a transparent body which does not destroy or endanger it but makes it more visible and bright by being in mary and by being born from mary christ has not only not destroyed her virginity but also magnified her virginity so in this way this is an analogy from nature not from bible but so using such expressions from nature from bible mar jacob also sent a phrase was very uh, effective in in communicating this message of the mystery of of redemption mystery of christ etc i think that is Uh, the importance of this thing namely that attitude of love humility wonder and then inviting you to participate in the mystery and to become enlightened and enlightened by what you read meditate and uh, live and it sounds like jacob expected his audience to spiritually prepare for what he had to say that they would understand their scriptures and that they would be fasting praying uh and so within that sort of milieu that you are constantly opening yourself to the grace of god through that ascetic preparation through bible reading and things like that that it appears he believed that then you'd be able to start digging deeper in some of those metaphors and stuff in the scriptures and so he could make use of pictures and things in the scriptures as you were saying and then they'd be able to make the light bulbs go off in their in the audience's head. Now this is a more strictly theological question. And I know it goes a little bit beyond what your research went into because 
This question is very much based upon later research in Jacob Sarug by a scholar named Fornet, uh, Fornes. And so I'll ask it to you and you can tell us what you know. Um, Fornes in his recent research has discussed how Jacob believed in the doctrine of Christ's voluntary suffering and death, citing the Hanatikon as his authority in teaching this. Now, in Hanatikon it says, For we say that both the miracles and the sufferings which he willingly endured in the flesh are one. This was later added to Canon 3 of Constantinople 2. So for those in the audience that are Eastern Orthodox, it appears we have uh, some Carolines in the audience today, that... Eastern Orthodox believe this as well because it's one of the canons of one of our ecumenical councils. So my question to you, Father James, is can you explain why it is important that Christ's suffering and death was voluntary as opposed to involuntary, such as how we experience suffering and death? Uh, since this is, as you said, it is a theological question, um, and this pertains to the realm of Christology. Christology is a topic which is the doubts are not yet cleared for many. Taking that into account, let us look at it. And uh, I think um, the, the aspect of uh, the suffering or the miracles, the miracles uh, pertain to divine aspect. Uh, the dynamics or even um, in Syria, Kailo, etc. Kaila, this the power, the divine power, and after the Chalcedon synod, uh, synod, what we come across is uh, you know the importance of looking at Jesus Christ, and uh, there is so uh, those people who look at the deophysite nature. Which, is, which was not appreciated by Jacob of Saruk. And he said, uh, already as a youth, I have uh, rejected that teaching. So we have to understand that in mind. And uh, let me precisely say uh, what is important for um, Jacob of Saruk is the expression that one incarnate nature or one incarnate word of God. That was that is the important thing for Jacob of Zero. And uh, in order to understand, because when we Christ willed to come for suffering, that is the faith that is uh, being uh, accepted in the church. For example, even um, at the time of Eucharistic consecration, this expression comes. And also in uh, Syriac, also the expression sbo that uh, aspect, not sorry, buso, that means he willed to come. And even at the time of incarnation uh, in the homily about the nativity of our Lord, the expression comes, the one who has no beginning willed to come to a beginning. And how? This is because the one who was who is God, at the time of the embodiment from Virgin Mary, became a human being without any change. So this is one person. So that is what we call the one incarnate word of God. I think understanding this, we needn't distinguish between who suffered whether was it voluntary or involuntary, because the, um, this was the will of God, and this is his own will. He says, Father, I have come to do your will. So there is no misunderstanding except this aspect. And uh, I think it is not only at the time of passion this question appears, but very at the very beginning of the nativity. Mark Jacob has a beautiful uh, expression in the nativity hymn he has he, uh, composed it like this let me try to paraphrase it uh, he says it is uh, presented in the form of a dialogue between mary the virgin mother and the 
child Jesus, the baby Jesus. He says, my, Mary says in the lullaby, Mary says, uh, O son, command these seraphim and uh, cherubim to go away so that let me honor you, let me serve you with the uh, respect you expect or you deserve from me because uh, this is presented because cherubim and seraphim are present because it is son of God, it is God himself who is uh, lying in the manger at Bethlehem and so because since they are uh, the manger is surrounded by these uh, celestial beings Mary does not have that freedom to uh, breastfeed her son or to honor him uh, or to sing his her own um, songs and express her own love and affection to the child Jesus. So this is portrayed in this uh, conversational form, but still this uh, what is important is the theological aspect. The one incarnate word of God is and his name is Christ. And this is seen in most of the homilies where Marjaka was a reference to uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God. All right. And I actually, I have to be perfectly honest, it's a, a little bit of a side, but uh, I find it very interesting that in there's debate over whether the early church in Kerala, whether there were pretty much East Syrian or West Syrian. And it, it's, it would seem to me the emphasis in Jacob of Sarug would, and as you're quoting really is from uh, Carl of Alexandria's first letter to Sixensis in the sixth paragraph, one incarnate nature, the son of God, that there seems to be a West Syrian emphasis if I, if I had a guess. And so I just find that very interesting. But that aside, let me ask this. Ephraim and Jacob are particularly popular for their exceedingly lofty veneration of the Mother God. How are their writings exceptional in this regard? Uh, let me recollect a comment of Professor Brock about this. He says, uh, whatever was the difference in the Christological understanding of these churches, they were very unique in expressing their love and affection to the mother of God. And, uh, you know, this is something beyond the expression, uh, human expression. And therefore, these fathers, whenever they refer to this, they compare uh, the mystery of um, incarnation and Mary's role in this redemption. And uh, they would connect it with the redemption achieved in Christ, not simply uh, looking at Mary separately, not simply Mary's um, shaman glory, but always in collaboration with the redemption and her role. And it starts way from the very beginning of Annunciation. So they take, they meditate on the scene of Annunciation till the time of crucifixion. And then they would refer back to all the events in the salvation history, starting with even uh, the, fall, the fall of Adam. till the And then say, uh, they would present Mary as how she brought the humanity uh, you know, uh, back to God's grace because of her fiat, yes, obedience to the will of God. And only because she said yes to the will of God, the Son of God became a human being from her. So that, that is a starting point. And this is really respected in every feast, in every memory they, they speak or refer to Mary this is the aspect they would uh, highlight. And then they have, as I have said, the symbols, paradoxes, or imagery from Bible, from nature, everything, they would say, look at it. For example, uh, Jacob of Sarug would compare Mary to Cherubim. And then uh, he would say, uh, Mary is 
far greater than the chariot of the cherubim because in the chariot they have chariot has got wheels and then uh, all this that etc but mary has the tongues tongue to praise god mary has the hands to carry the uh, the glorious son the, the son of god so in this way in even when they compare mary to that kind of symbolism for example mary is um, viewed as ark of the covenant then afterwards in summing up they uh, marjaka would say see you are far greater than the ark of the covenant in the ark of the covenant god was dwelling god was present people felt protection guidance and uh, um, god's redeeming presence but in you he is really present so in this way they would compare and then present and then they would glorify uh, god because of her life because of her um, faithfulness to god now did jacob sarug and ephraim have any differences minor or major in their mariology uh, i have not uh, done a comparison in that way uh, but i would say there is a progress in it there is a development I, um, namely the the feast of assumption that is it is not a difference i would say but it is a progress it is a development uh, depending on the faith of that community because by that time uh, there was importance of celebrating the feast of martyrs the feast of saints and then the church also uh, expressed her uh, respect honor by showing faith in the assumption of mary um, this is uh, home, uh, that homily is, is said to have been delivered on the 14th of august in uh, in a church so in that way i think it is a development but not uh, um, not much of but a difference yeah they're not inconsistent i see and yeah, so you were in- t- you were touching on in your response i'm going to quote your research you say that the basis of her that's mary's holiness is her cooperation um with god's grace can you explain precisely what you mean by cooperation is this only a reference to the annunciation and why is this distinction you're making important uh because that is the pivotal point in the salvation history and see uh, i would like to compare it with another analogy of mar jacob mar jacob would say look at the sun the sun is glorious because it shine it gives warmth heat so in a, in a way it is protecting the earth all of us but the sun does not have the freedom or is not doing this out of the freedom but it's a na- it is the nature of the sun to produce light energy etc isn't it but look at mary mary has exercised her freedom mary was uh, uh, given the message she has a question to ask she asked the question and when the question was clearly answered she understood the origin of the message or the provenance and then she said here i am the uh, servant of god let it happen to me as your word and which means this is she has not consulted anybody she has just asked what is the source of this message she understood this is the divine invitation to participate in a unique uh, mission when she understood she said yes and then what has happened god came and dwelt in her and from that moment there is a new face her calling is different from all other human beings so uh, free, the exercise of freedom and the subsequent collaboration 
until the end of her life and even today in the life of christian that is what i meant by the cooperation uh, in uh, of mary and so the cooperation begins earning her life particularly at the incarnation but it continues for the rest of eternity for the theotokos now let me ask you this this is a fun question being that you're from india but you've studied in Rome, so you know both East and West. And so this is strictly your opinion. How have Western scholars mishandled Ephraim and Jacob, particularly in the field of Mariology? Uh, You're smiling. That's a, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Uh, see, I won't say that they have mishandled. For example, Saint Ephraim is the only Syrian father who has been uh, declared as the doctor of the church in the Catholic Church. So it shows the great appreciation of the church towards Saint Ephraim's doctrine, the, the faithfulness that she, he has shown through interpretation of scripture, teachings on the sacrament, etc. So, and also uh, Mar Jacob. Mar Jacob uh, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, you know, the process of canonization uh, and then declaration of someone as a saint, that has not taken place. But the but for us Syrians, Mar itself is uh, the term standing for um, a saint, sir, lord, etc. So um, that does not matter because when you read his homilies, the way he lived or the expression he has given that itself is a sign of his sanctity and the perfection that he achieved or he want he had already always in mind and now uh, coming to western scholars i think uh, i am really indebted not i but everyone who studies mar jacob we are indebted to a man called paul bedjan he is a French Lazarist priest who has edited the work of Mar Jacob of Saruk. So, if, and uh, he is a Frenchman, he studied Syriac and he edited this work, that means um, if a Western scholar had not done it, I would not have uh, learned about Mar Jacob. Of course, as a West Syrian um, churchman, I would have learned uh, the liturgical prayers, sacraments, Eucharist, etc., but not that the, the heritage of Mar Jacob of Saruk. So my indebtedness to this stands there. And then the handicap of language. This, it is not that easy uh, um, to pursue the study of a Syriac language in order to translate, understand, and uh, enjoy the writings. But there is a greater awareness now in, of course, in Mar Ephraim, but now also in Mar Jacob, because I know many uh, many scholars who have done work in this field. For example, Fornes himself has um, collected documents and uh, uh, made that beautiful comment on Henoticon. Yes, I think uh, I have told you what I know about their understanding. One more thing is, you know, in this aspect, especially in the 5th and 6th century, it was not that common to address Mary as mother of God. Even though we say God bearer, that expression is not uh, frequently used by Mar Jacob either. So that is one of the, uh, of the comments that I have heard from Western scholars. So that means uh, they would say that um, I am sorry to say that the Syrian fathers would not call Mary as mother of God. So I think uh, this was reflecting the time and theology of their own time. So I wouldn't say that uh, Syrian scholars are wrong or the comment of the Western scholars wrong. Okay. Now, in your in your book, you make mention of Constantino Vona and and J. S. Asimani with their handling of Jacob Asruk and now 
you might not have their names in the top of your head, but it, it pertains to the their treatment of the Immaculate Conception in some of the works. They try to infer the Immaculate Conception. So my question to you um, plainly would be, did Ephraim or Jacob teach the Immaculate Conception, like maybe some of those scholars would assert, or did they imply it in any sense? See, the Immaculate Conception is uh, is a dogma that has evolved a little later. And uh, a formulation, Immaculate Conception, we do not come across in these bodies for that reason. <clears throat> but what is the theology implied immaculate by uh, behind the immaculate conception is the sanctity, the holiness of Mary. For example, Ephraim has a beautiful expression. He says, uh, you and your mother alone are entirely holy, for there is no sin neither in you nor in your mother. So I think that is uh, the most beautiful expression from a Syrian father about Mary's um, state of grace. Hmm? And then, but we, uh, as I said, this is a later, uh, the Immaculate Conception is a later uh, development in theology. Um, so we do not, uh, we are not able to say anything of that sort. But what is uh, very clear is uh, Mark Jacobson uh, composition. He says, Mary was holy, limpid, and free from every stain of sin. And if there was anybody holier than Mary, God would not have chosen Mary, but only the other person. So saying uh, the expressions like this would uh, um, highlight on Mary's holiness, and so it is. Uh, it is not that uh, theologically right to ascribe or anything that has come later to this or this. That is what I would say, uh, very personally. Father, you there? You're breaking up a little bit. Hello. Father, you were Hello. you were breaking up. Can you just repeat your last sentence, please? Hello. Father, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Father James? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. All right, yeah, you broke up. Could you repeat your last uh, couple sentences, please? Yeah, I have said, uh, you know, it is difficult to uh, assume from our reading what Ephraim or Jacob has uh, said, because they have not spoken about these aspects. For example, Ephraim in the Nisibian hymns, he, say, he would say, you, that means Christ, alone and your mother are beautiful in every way, for there is no blemish in thee, my Lord, and no stain in thy mother. And Mar Jacob has another expression about Mary's holiness. He says, because he, God, saw how pure she was and limpid her soul, he wanted to dwell in her since she was free from evils. Since a woman like her had never been seen, an amazing work was done in her, which is the greatest of all. So my, uh, my conclusion would be that it is very difficult to make a comment about uh, their, uh, their 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 perspective on uh, immaculate conception because this was not a topic of discussion during their time. That so I also would not uh, say uh, any comment on that aspect. But what I would say is they would uh, very clearly speak about Mary's holiness that she has been holy, pure, and uh, uh, without any stain of sin, that they would say. All right, because yeah, what, what interested me was a comment you said, I think it's page 211 in your book. 
You say, when we read carefully the original text, you're speaking of Jacob's Rug, we understand that an interpretation of this text in favor of Mary's exclusion from original sin is not plausible. There is no ambiguity in the Syriac text in this respect. Mary is spoken of as humble, pure, limpid, uh, and without blemish. And so my question for you is, would that imply the Immaculate Conception? Is it consistent, the Immaculate Conception? Because without blemish sounds to be a very strong terminology. But you're saying in the Syriac, there is no um, no ambiguity that would permit that interpretation. Do you mind giving us some detail on that? Um, I would say that... Um... You know, the, we are called to be immaculate, the expression in St. Paul. I don't remember that text. I think that would be uh, the approach of the Syrian fathers in that, because the, the concept um, of original sin and then of immaculate conception, as I have said, it is coming a li little later. And so uh, it is rather difficult to make such a comment, but it's a theological understanding of the church. But uh, when we celebrate um, the Feast of Mary, we always refer to Mary as a pearl without stain. And I would say the symbolic expressions of this sort would refer to her whole being as, um, of course, being chosen and, and holy. I think that would be the, the aspect I would prefer. Okay. So not, not on part of her life, but the whole of her life, the whole of who she yes. is. Let me, let, me, let me ask you this, because you get into some detail about Jacob and Ephraim, about the Annunciation. And so what is the importance of the Annunciation, according to Ephraim and Jacob, as pertains to the Mother of God's holiness? What happened at the Annunciation that purified her? Uh, that's a good question, because uh, when we celebrate a feast in the Syrian church, I think that's the same also for any church. The point of... Uh, Annunciation is very vital because it is, as I said, it is where a human being chosen from among the whole human race says yes to participate in the role in, in the redemption of human being. And now Mar Jacob has a beautiful homily on the Annunciation and he would present the whole scene in such a uh, very marvelous way and then he would present a few aspects, um, namely the question of Mary. Uh, how would this um, come to pass? Because I am a woman who do not know a, a, a man. So this question, uh, Mar Jacob would take and would present the scenario of the fall and the redemption of human being. Fall in the sense, he would say, Look at the dialogue between Eve and the serpent. The dialogue between Eve and serpent, actually there is no uh, dialogue. The serpent uh, prompted, gave the counsel, and Eve easily con uh, acceded to uh, the serpent's um, promise or advice or instruction. And then Mar Jacob would say, now look at this virgin. Both are virgin, but here this virgin, at the time of the dialogue or the arrival of Gabriel, she, she took the courage to ask the angel a question. She did not blindly uh, obey what Gabriel said. She asked, how would it happen? And this is a prudent question. Since she asked a prudent question, that gave the divine messenger the opportunity to give the answer, the revelation about what the, the plan of God. And when Mary realized that this is the plan of God, she said yes, and then um, 
the incarnation took place but before uh, one more thing as i said about previously the freedom the aspect of freedom i don't repeat it here and this uh, fiat yes is the exercise of her freedom so that is another aspect mardia kabood say and then maybe the the point that might interest every christian is the point of sanctification mar jacob would say why this when she when mary asked the question the holy spirit would come and jacob has uh, a few lines about that he uh, he would say first the holy spirit came sanctified her and how did he sanctify her or what is the purpose he came and sanctified her the holy spirit sanctified her he would say he placed mary in that state of grace in which adam and eve were before they committed a sin committed the sin so in order to so to bring her back to that position that means the retrieval of all that took place happens in mary because holy spirit sanctified so after sanctification of mary the word came and dwelt so first power uh, the holy spirit came and uh, sanctified secondly the word came and dwelt so in this way and then finally uh, the incarnation took place so this is the way uh, mar jacob would uh, treat the mystery of annunciation and uh, in the um, orthodox tradition or the syrian tradition Uh, this is very important feast and um, you know usually on good friday um, we do not celebrate holy eucharist but in the in an 18th century chronicle it is said even if the uh, the feast of annunciation falls on good friday we would celebrate it because it is the original the, the first feast of all other feasts therefore we should celebrate the feast of annunciation even if it falls on good friday so that is a very important feast in in the syrian church yeah it's the quote uh jacob sruk you have a a paragraph of his in your book on the annunciation jacob said that he the holy spirit sanctified her purified her and made her blessed among women He freed her from that curse of sufferings on account of Eve her mother. The spirit freed her from that debt that she might be beyond transgression when he solemnly dwelt in her. He purified the mother by the Holy Spirit while dwelling in her that he might take from her a pure body without sin. And so this is quoting you. You said Mary's purification was necessary for the Son of God to assume a body without sin. as the descent of the holy spirit upon mary was to let loose from her the former sentence of eve and adam so it's uh in orthodox theology we call it the prepurification of the theotokos it's all over our hymnography and it's pretty much like uh, you could see in ephraim the syrian in the diatessaron when he uh, exegetes luke 135 Everyone who looks at this event that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you as this purification as you point out in your book. Now, let me ask about an interesting detail at the end of Jacob Sruk's recalling of Mary's dormition or her falling asleep where he says that death came to the Theotokos that she might taste his the Lord's cup. So, my question to you was is was her death voluntary in the same sense as Christ or how was it different yeah i, I don't think that the expression uh, cup of death uh, would mean anything other than the human reality of death that means the time has come to uh, that her that she passes from this life to eternity i think it is in this way we have to understand though the expression uh, cup of death might uh, resemble or might uh, uh, have a uh, dif- uh, different uh, meaning a different um, you know 
tendency to to refer to some other thing but i don't think that it is uh, in that way because the whole uh, hymn on the death and burial of mary it is presented also the reality of human death and then it, the, the marvelous aspect is as i have pointed out earlier uh, the coming of angels to receive her and then uh, the citation from the psalm which says open the gates of heaven the law, the mother of the king is coming so this um, expression also would say the glorious entry of mary into heaven so i don't think that it is uh, not a question of voluntary or, or involuntary thing it's a natural sequence of life nothing more than that but uh, what i would say is uh, the homily would uh, uh, point to one aspect namely as though she had known beforehand the time of her death that um, that is presented there in uh, in mar jacob's homily in the beginning so it was when it was time she decided that the apostles would come and that she might say goodbye to them in that aspect yes all right and so you've answered pretty much my whole gamut of questions and so my last to you would be to give you an opportunity for any closing comments on jacob asrug's mariology and why it's important and what you'd like the audience to take away with it from it well first of all uh, let me say um, you know as christians what very important is uh, as would jesus would say listen to the word of god and follow it that is that would be the message that mary has for us for every season and secondly uh, as mar jacob would present in the homily we have got an intercessor we have got a mediator before god with mar jacob uh, i think is first among the syrian or one among the syrian fathers uh, in the 5th century 6th century who has composed a beautiful hymn uh, you have it in the book but still i can read it out because uh, this is not a prayer to mary but uh, by, by her prayer son of god have mercy on me that is the way mar jacob would present let me read it out the first at least a few uh, lines uh, o son of god by her prayers make your peace to dwell make wars to cease and remove trials and plagues restore calm and tranquility to the earth heal the infirm cure the sick fill the hungry be a father to orphans whom death has left destitute in your pity drive out de devils who harass mankind and exalt your church to the four quarters of the globe that it may sing your praise watch over priests and purify ministers be a guardian of all age and youth o bridegroom christ to you be praise from every mouth and on us be mercy at all times amen amen so i think this is uh, a beautiful uh, part from mar jacob's homily to sum up our uh, our talk on on mary because he presents mary as an intercessor on behalf of human beings all right well i very much appreciate you giving us all that information on jacob asrup and and saint ephraim and I just want to share a screen. I want people to see your book. I got a picture of it on Amazon. And uh, But you told me you just wanted to share the love of God. And that was your motivation for interview. Um, but for those interested, you could buy Father James' book on Amazon. And so there it is on the screen. And uh, while you guys look at that, I've got a question from Zebi, which is, are there any writings of St. Ephraim or Jacob that were preserved in Kerala but lost in Syria. Are you aware of any, Father James? 
Uh, I am not aware of it, but uh, if you are interested, you can contact Father Jacob Thakaparambal, the director of St. Ephraim Research Ecumenical Institute, Kottayam, Kerala. All right. And so, I mean, I would have to say that'd be very interesting that because we lose works to history all the time. Uh, for example, St. Irenaeus has a only extant manuscript of the demonstration, the preaching of the apostles was an Arminian. It was only discovered like a hundred years ago. So the idea that we have works that may be in uh, Mal Malayalam or in Ge'ez or in some of these uh, more peripheral languages when it comes to the Roman world would be extremely interesting. And so could you give the name of the gentleman um, from the same organization that you're part of that may know? Uh, the person I have referred to now? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, let me try it. As Father James is doing that, if you guys have any other questions, this is your time now. And I just want to say to the audience, if this show has blessed you, um, you could bless the churches of Cambodia as we always do on this show. And you could go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. Please support also Father James. You could purchase his book. It's not a cheap book, but you could you could get his book. Um, and you see it right there. Um, there's also, please pray for the uh, Christians, um, whether they be in Kerala or wherever else. Um, though I don't think, well, when Father James is ready, I don't think there's any pressing issues in that region at this point. But always pray for those that are on this show um, because they bless us. And so pray for them as a way of paying them back for their kindness. So please pray for uh, pray for myself, for example. Please pray for Father James. Um, we see uh, the name of uh, Father fa uh, Father Dr. Jacob, and I'm going to pronounce wrong, Theka Param yes. Hill, Hill, Director, Siri of Kariam Kerala. So I'm going to just put that in the chat box so people see it. Actually, and um, from that, excuse me. This book I'm sorry, is, what father? My book is published from uh, that institute, Moranito. Yes. That is a publication from Mar uh, in and it was published at the initiative of Father Jacob Tekeparambil. Yes, and I noticed that for, for those who are wondering, if you read the book, the publisher is the same organization. And so um he, he had your dissertation published. Let me ask you this really quick, uh, which would be any of your writings on the, do you have any writings on the liturgy? Have you written any other published works? I have written articles. Um, okay. In, in a couple of publications on liturgy, yes, yes. on Mariology, liturgy. And then we have got a publication from BVP. I think I have sent you a message this afternoon. Uh, I mean, in the morning. Uh, BVP is Bethany Veda Vijnan Pit. That is a, that is an institute for studying Oriental theology. That is um, we offer uh, BTH course, but it is in collaboration with the Papal Seminary in Pune. And uh, this being an Oriental institute, we conduct once in three years. Um, international conferences actually uh, we have got some seven books we have published from 2005 we have organized every three years we have um, conferences and we publish the books and uh, my article on liturgy of saint james and uh, and also some other articles and uh, it's actually a good collection bvp publication so if somebody is interested uh, there are books let me Actually, this is a book on the theologization of uh, in the Malangara Catholic Church. And then we have got the, another one on ecumenism and uh, another one Eucharist of Saint, Liturgy of St. James. So we have got some uh, four, four books uh, we have published from Vedani Veda Vijnan Pit Pune. And uh, for scholars, that these books might be really interesting. 
if you can, please send me the links uh, where people could get access to those. And so that way I could share that, uh, share that here. So people would have access to that because they'll, this show will be archived for people to watch. Is there any, anything else, uh, any other organizations or things that you're up to that you would like us to support? Uh, actually the, um, Siri, the Institute I referred earlier, uh, there you can study Syriac, do research. Actually, they offer an M MA program, Master's in Arts uh, program. It is approved by the University, Mahatma Gandhi University in Kerala. It is in quite a middle part of Kerala that institute is situated. And it conducts also once oh, in so four years Syriac, con Syriac conferences. So they, yep. they won't have to go all the way to Rome. They could get educated right there. <laughs> the um, Well, Father Jacob, it's been a real pleasure to be able to speak with you. I have to say, like, you read a scholar's work, and then you find out that scholar's half a world away, and you go, well, I'm never going to talk to this guy or meet him or anything. But thanks to the wonders of technology, we're looking at each other right now, so it's really quite incredible. Yes, so yes, let me just again give you my thanks and thanks to half the audience. And uh, I will otherwise end this show as I end all my shows by quoting Jesus Rock, who says, fight to death for the truth. The Lord God will fight for you. God bless you all. Have a great day. And, and Father, stay on uh, off the air. I'm uh, ending the show.